Uh, this is a lecture for Bio 108 Plant and Society. It's about early humans, our ancestors, and how they went from hunter-gatherers to farmers. Here are people who lived in uh, the northern part of South America and Venezuela, and they're part of the Pume tribe. And this is from 20 years ago, and here a man is hunting with the bow and arrow, and a woman carries a metal digging stick and a basket. So we're going to talk about how humans got food for most of human history, uh, talk about where and when farming arose, and list plants that were native to the Americas and native to Asia and Europe before the two were connected. So humans have been around for 195,000 years. Before that were other hominids who were our ancestors. And of those 195,000 years, 185,000 of them, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. We've only been doing farming for about 10 to 14,000 years. So we got our food by searching for wild food, whether it was plants or animals. So when we were hunter-gatherers, uh, there were a few people who lived on the coast where it was rich enough in food that they stayed there year round. But most people were nomadic or semi-nomadic. So they would stay in one place for a while and then move to a different place. Um, they didn't stay in the same place year round, but they did have a defined territory. They weren't necessarily moving from place to place to place to new places, okay? Uh, a lot of people around the world still do some hunting and gathering, but very few people um, make their whole living doing it. There are a few tribes probably in the Amazon, maybe some tribes in New Guinea that are hunter-gatherers, but most people, they may do hunter, get, hunter hunting and gathering for some of their food, but they also do animal husbandry. They also uh, do farming. So here's a picture from the 1900s of uh, an Inuit hunter in Alaska, and you can see he's hunting for seal. Uh, here's a picture of some people in the Pacific in a place called Micronesia. And uh, this was written in Japanese and I had it translated. So this was probably uh, just before or early on during World War II. And the people of Ponape, an island in Micronesia, make a drink called shakao. The juice is obtained by pulling the roots out of a ginger-like plant and crushing it on a flat rock. Uh, this drink is an intoxicating beverage consumed at celebrations. So there is some idea that it might be similar to kava. Okay, and I think it's pretty obvious that uh, all hunter-gatherers are not the same. Those people living on an island in Micronesia aren't gonna be eating the same foods as a person who's in uh, Alaska near the Arctic Circle. Okay, here's somebody in Australia and here's a um, piece of rock art showing a hunter capturing a, capturing a kangaroo. Well, people in other parts of the world don't have kangaroos. All right, so the sand people of South Africa are some of the oldest people in the world going back 20,000 years. And you can click on the following link and it's just one page and it talks about the sand people. Uh, it shows them in their native dress and whether they're dressed up for tourists or not, it's not really clear. But if you go to this next um, slide and watch this video, it's about a 10 minute video and you'll see that uh, most of the sand don't look like this anymore. Okay, so maybe they're doing it for traditional reasons, they're dressing up or for the tourists, but um, most people who are hunter gatherers um, wear modern clothes and a lot of them have switched from the traditional bow and arrow to rifles and so on. Okay, if you watch this video, and I expect you will, uh, between four minutes and 50 seconds and, and five minutes, there's an actual photo uh, of some San who were executed. And whether they accused them of stealing or what, I don't really know. But if you want to try and fast forward at that point or look away, you may wish to look away. All right, uh, the sand in South Africa ate about 2,000 calories a day. It was two-thirds a plant-based diet. Uh, there were 100 species of plants that they would use, 50 species of animals. Basically, they ate what was available, depending on where they were in the time of year. 
And starting in the 1950s, their land was taken from them, and so there wasn't enough land to maintain their way of life. Uh, just as a contrast, um, we're looking at the Inuit. So these are the people who live in Alaska and Canada and uh, northern Greenland towards the Arctic Circle. Uh, we used to call them Eskimo, but now they're known as Inuit. That's uh, not a uh, favorable name, so they don't want to be called that. And so um, um, the native people of the Americas, the last immigration was the migration of ancestors that gave rise to the Inuit. So they've only been here in the Americas for a thousand years, which are less than the other tribes that are here. Uh, genetically, they're different, and they're certainly the most recent migration. Uh, they're hunters, fishermen. The traditional diet consists of whales, seals, polar bears, birds, fish, uh, lacking plants in the winter. Uh, how do they get vitamins? From eating a lot of the internal organs. So we tend to eat the muscle meat and they eat the internal organs. But in the summer, there were some grasses, roots, berries that were part of their diet. Uh, about half their diets from fat, about a third from protein, and 20% from carbohydrate. So it was a low carbohydrate diet, mostly from animals. Uh, here's a three minute video, an Inuit man talking about um, his culture. And here's a picture from the 1920s of an Inuit man in a, in a kayak. All right, so the fossil record tells us what early humans ate. They ate fruits, nuts, roots, tubers. Tubers are things growing underground like the potatoes. And the introduction of fire was important for the cooking of roots and tubers that are difficult to digest. Uh, some people have hypothesized that the ability to cook is what allowed our brains to develop because we didn't have to spend so much of our energy uh, circulating blood to our our stomach to digest all the all the fibrous food. Uh, different early humans ate different foods depending on where they lived. Think about what the San ate versus what the Inuit ate. Um, so this is from the Journal of Internal Medicine, and they're showing the ancestors of uh, Homo sapiens, were Homo erectus, Homo habilis, uh, the first hominins and that we went from a fruit-based diet to an omnivorous diet. Uh, and then we used fire to start cooking the meat that we ate and uh, became a carnivorous diet. So. Uh, more recently, DNA has allowed us to uh, find DNA in the plaque on teeth. So there, here are some teeth of Neanderthal man and they found that it was a diet that had a lot of starchy foods. So what does that say about this idea that the Palo Paleolithic diet was just full of meat? Okay, so think about what you saw. What are the strength of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle? Uh, why did it die out? Well, or it's largely died out. Okay, so some people claim the ideal diet that our bodies are attuned to over most of history is the diet of hunter-gatherers. And they say, well, today's diet contains a lot of our calories from carbohydrates, from rice and wheat and grain and from processed food. And uh, Lauren Cordain, professor at Colorado State, sort of pioneered the paleo diet. And he said, well, here, here are the things you shouldn't eat. You shouldn't eat dairy or refined sugar or processed foods, not potatoes. Here are the things you should eat. Lots of meat and fish and eggs vegetables, fruits, and nuts, natural oils. Okay. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about how native people in America has lived, I've taken ASB 223, Buried Cities and Lost Tribes, and they look at artifacts and try to, to reconstruct uh, how people lived who have been here in the, the new world for, oh, I think it goes back about 15,000 years. All right, and then about 10,000 years ago, humans switched from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers. We're not really sure why, but it happened in many parts of the world simultaneously. And it may be partly because it corresponded to a change of Earth climate. We went from a very dry ice age to a wetter, warmer climate. Here are the parts of the world where farming arose uh, in the eastern U.S., in Mexico and South America, in the Middle East, 
uh, in China and New Guinea. So we have archaeological villages that started popping up. So one of the benefits of agriculture is if you stayed in one place, you could build a village. Uh, populations grew because they had increasing calories that were stable. Um, once you were in one place, you could start accumulating possessions. You could start building baskets to carry water and um, pots to carry water, uh, grinding stones to grind grain. So a lot of specialty things that uh, would be hard to carry around with you from place to place. Uh, the diet became more focused on grains, which often led to nutritional deficiency. So this is one of the harms. So people became shorter and were sometimes deficient in nutrients. Uh, closer contact between more people led to the spread of infectious diseases. Uh, a larger population led to famine if the crops failed. So um, it wasn't all beneficial, but it was sort of an inexorable uh, rise of, or change of how we lived. And if you look at the DNA evidence from Europe, from some places it shows that new groups came in and replaced the former residents. So people who were farmers replaced the hunter-gatherers. Uh, in other places, it shows that uh, the new people who came in mixed with the local residents, and their DNA is a mixture between the uh, hunter-gatherers and, um, and the farmers. Okay, but it wasn't the technology that got passed along. It was actually the people doing the farming that established these new um, developments. So uh, what conflicts can you envision between farmers and hunter-gatherers? So think about the sand people of Africa and what was the conflict they had with the local farmers. Uh, the United Nations has heritage sites for sites that are very important for human heritage. So for example, the Grand Canyon, I believe, is a heritage site. You know, as you can look at the list, uh, I've been to a number of sites that are heritage, heritage sites. I, a couple of summers ago, I was in Mexico and went to Teotihuacan, north of Mexico City and the pyramids. So here are some really important sites from our past and includes a site in Turkey uh, that is about 9,000 years old and one of, was one of the first farming communities. All right, so uh, there are certain technologies that helped improve the farming. So uh, people replanted plants that had better characteristics uh, people bred animals that had better characteristics, and what those characteristics were uh, just depended on what they were growing, what they were using for. But here's an example. Wild wheat, the grains break off and drop to the ground, and that's important to spread the seeds and keep them growing. Well, if you're farming wheat, you don't want the grains to break off. You want the grains to stay on the head of the wheat. So um, when they found plants that had the characteristics they wanted, those were the plants they replanted the following year. Okay, similarly, there's a wild ancestor to corn called teosinte. It's a grass and it produces about a dozen grains for every plant. It looks like corn except for the grain itself. And then here's modern day corn and here's an intermediate. You can still cross teosinte with modern corn. It hasn't uh, been altered that much, it can still interbreed, but look how much more grain there is on a modern era of corn than there would have been on teosinte. Uh, here's a map showing some of the different uh, plants that came from the New World, squash, sun, sunflower, uh, sweet potato, potato, quinoa, some of the plants from uh, the Old World, uh, wheat from the Middle East, barley from the Middle East, rice from Asia, banana from uh, New Guinea. So here's just a list. I, I just chose a few things. So these are things that were in the Americas. Corn, squash, chili, potatoes, avocados, tomatoes, tobacco. So they were unknown before the Europeans um, sailed in the late 1400s to the New World and started uh, trade between the New and Old World. Here are some things that were brought to the Americas from the Old World. Wheat, rice, bananas, grapes, apples, peaches. Okay, and so 
1493 was when Columbus landed and some of the best and worst events of the last 500 years can be traced to that voyage. Uh, domesticated animals mostly are from the old world. Sheep, cows, goats, horses, chickens, pigs. Uh, there are a few in the new world, turkeys, alpacas, llamas. Sometimes it's just the luck of the draw and how societies develop because it's not as if they knew more how to domesticate animals because there are no animals that are important in agriculture that have really been domesticated since the Europeans contacted us 500 years ago. So it just so happened that there were animals in Asia and Europe that were easier to domesticate than, than the ones in the New World.